Good morning, Boker Tov. Buenos dias. Sabah alikher. This is Shana Fold here with the Israel Daily News Podcast. I'm here to give you the headlines so you can get caught up quickly. You're listening, so you're already on top of your game. Survive and thrive, people. Knowledge is the best weapon. Today is Thursday, November 19th, 2020, which means we have a special report at the end of the show. You're going to like this, especially if you're an intellect, if you care about government, diplomacy, this is for you. Now, let's get to the news. First, let's follow up on a story about the explosives that were found along the Syrian border in northern Israel. The Israel Defense Forces is blaming it on Iran's elite Quds Force. They say the three explosives, which did not detonate, were planted in Israeli territory, causing the IDF to have to react with airstrikes. The Times of Israel has an article out highlighting that during the sit-down between Prime Minister Netanyahu and Bahrain's foreign minister yesterday, the Bahraini minister never said the word Jerusalem. The report also mentioned that the ministry website wrote the delegation had been in Tel Aviv. The Times of Israel article leads readers to believe that this was intentional and not an innocent mistake. I will read it to you right off of the Bahraini Ministry of Foreign Affairs website. It says here, Time has come to depart from the conflicts and instability that afflicted the Middle East for decades and pursue other policies to reach a comprehensive solution that achieves prosperity and development for all, Foreign Minister Abdulatif Al-Zayani has said. Al-Zayani made the statement as an official Bahraini delegation arrived in Tel Aviv on the first visit of its kind to Israel. Okay, now I'm going to go back to the Times of Israel article. The piece leads readers to believe that this was intentional and not an innocent mistake. I suppose we'll never know. Jerusalem is a contested city. Guatemala, the U.S., and Honduras recognize it as the capital of the Jewish state. The Palestinian Authority and their supporters believe Jerusalem belongs to them, and they plan to include it, at least the eastern section of Jerusalem, in a two-state solution. Now, I think that the article is a little slanted, because if you go here to the website, mofa.gov.bh for Bahrain, it says that the official delegation arrived in Tel Aviv, which is true. The plane arrived at Ben Gurion Airport, which is in Tel Aviv. So I don't really think that this is an issue, but you can you can take that and think about that as you like. An American immigrant is working to fight sexual abuse within the Israeli Orthodox community and making great strides. Debbie Gross founded Tahel a crisis center for Orthodox women and children who are victims of sexual abuse. In 1993, she says it took the Orthodox community a long time to realize the severity of the abuse. Rabbis would deny that there was even a problem in their communities. Now Gross has found that the Haredi community has made more progress than anyone, according to her, in sexual abuse prevention. Tahel provides a 24-hour hotline for victims, escorts them to the police, to hospitals, and guides them through the court system. Tahel also offers cultural and religiously sensitive workshops in Haredi schools for prevention, as well as trainings, post-trauma workshops, and safety protocols for workplaces throughout Israel. The issue is here that Gross is helping Orthodox Jews who are less likely to turn to outsiders for help, so less likely to go outside of the Orthodox community to get help. So this is a different approach. And amidst the pandemic, the organization now runs support groups via Zoom and is working on opening a WhatsApp hotline for victims who are too afraid to pick up the phone and make that call out of fear of being heard. Art shows and cultural events are coming back to Tel Aviv, Yafo. The municipality announced that it will be holding hundreds of new performances and events every week in hopes to, according to the Tel Aviv mayor, provide a livelihood for thousands of people, medicine for the souls of city residents, and hope for an entire sector that feels abandoned and neglected. While museums and theaters are still going to be closed, Tel Aviv will be following coronavirus regulations and using open-air venues to host the cultural events. These include art festivals for free, walking tours, performances of plays in parks, songs and stories 
along city boulevards, online art workshops, music and dance performances, performances in a glass-walled lobby where audiences can actually watch from outside. You can go to visit.tel-aviv.gov.il for Israel to see the options. Last night, Israeli basketball star Denny Avida was selected ninth overall by the Washington Wizards in the 2020 NBA draft. He became the third Israeli to make it to the NBA, and at age 19, he's the youngest player to do so. The six foot nine, 225 pounder helped Maccabi Tel Aviv win the 2018 and 2019 FIBA U20 European Championships at home in Israel, and plans on translating his game to run with the big dogs in the NBA. For me to represent my country and to make history, that's a blessing, the basketball star said. You have our support, Denny. Keep going. Make Israel proud. And now for our special report. The separation of powers is a bedrock of modern constitutionalism. This idea of separation was created by Jewish scholars and rabbis from centuries ago. You can find the literature dating back to biblical times. You can find it in the Dead Sea Scrolls. And now Dr. David Flato has a new book out about this. It is called The Crown and the Courts, Separation of Powers in the Early Jewish Imagination. Flato is a Hebrew University professor and has also taught at reputable universities like NYU, Columbia, UPenn, and Penn State. His idea is to show how a foundation of democratic rule was contemplated and justified long before liberal democracy was ever even born. Now, he's also studying Greek, and he studies all kinds of text from every society, so we can really trust that he's not just proud of being Jewish. Today, we'll talk about how his book has become startlingly relevant in 2020. Hint, he started to write this 10 years ago. All right, David Flato, thank you for joining us on the show. Great to be here. I'm a big fan. Thank you. Um, so tell us a bit about the concepts of the book. Tell us about the book. So, yeah, sure. So uh, the book uh, has sort of a large claim. And the large claim is that in early Jewish writings, and by early I mean beginning in the Bible, but mainly in post-biblical literature. So that means writings from the Second Temple times. Uh, and then from rabbinic times, so if we want to put years on it, from around 5th century BC, 4th century BC, until around 5th century CE, uh, that one finds a lot of different writings and ideas and inclinations about questions of uh, legal authority and political authority. So there's a lot there, but still there's a certain pattern that one can discern. And the pattern is that uh, the person who controls the law or the people who control law and have legal authority should not be empowered. Um, those should be people who do not have what we would call political authority. So that's a sort of idea that maybe is a given um, to modern ears, to Western ears, an idea of separation of powers, that the administration of justice should not be dominated by the politically powerful. Uh, but should be kept separate. There should be independent justice. That's a modern idea. But in the ancient world, that was a very rare idea. Um, and in that sense, it was really ahead of its times. It was a revolutionary impulse. Again, I don't want to overstate. I don't want to say the Jews invented the idea of independent justice and all that. They, there's a lot of ideas about justice in the ancient world. But I do think what is striking and stunning is that Jewish writers, write, writings tend in a certain direction. They tend to be aware of this problem. In other words, they, they're aware that justice is precious, um, that it is crucial for living um, a, um, you know, a just life, a just social life. You need a system of justice and it's vulnerable. Uh, the system of justice is vulnerable, and it can be trampled by politically powerful people. In the ancient world, there were politically powerful people, and modern times, there are politically powerful people who will try to trample on the system of justice. Um, so the early Jewish writings try to find ways in their own language, in their own writings, to be aware of this problem, to navigate this tension, 
and to carve out an autonomous sphere for the administration of justice. So to buffer it and to keep it um, safe from the intervention of politically powerful people, whether those be Romans or Greeks or Persians or Jews. That's really the most important thing. That even if there are powerful Jews, they too might come to hijack the systems of justice and intervene and, inter and, and interfere. And that cannot um, be successful. That will ultimately lead to a deterioration of systems of justice. Okay. Um, so that's the large theme. Okay. Very, very interesting. Would you, this is going to be our last question. Would you say that, I, I want to have two, two ideas in, in our last question. Would you say that this is relevant for today's political uh, landscape in Israel or in the United States or both? Yeah. So, I mean, that's for sure a striking thing about, uh, you know, this book project and these ideas I've been thinking about. Because part of what you want to do in a, as a scholar is to try to find a sphere that you're somewhat detached and somewhat removed and somewhat objective. And here I certainly found that I'm looking at really old writings. You know, they're writings I love. But I try to be impartial and not be too much of, uh, you know, sort of let the text speak for themselves. At the same time, I think the ideas within them are ideas that resonate. And I write about this explicitly in the introduction to my book, and I write it about it towards the end. That there are ideas here that um, in the Western world we continue to grapple with. It's really remarkable. I say that it's sort of a given that you should have autonomous spheres of justice. But we know how as an ideal we could talk about that. But in reality, um, the autonomy of justice is always um, vulnerable, always imperiled, and always subject to great political pressures. That's true in America. That's true in Israel. Um, so, uh, you know, here in America, where I'm spending time right now, uh, during uh, this semester, um, you know, obviously under the Trump administration, uh, there have been amazing challenges to the constitutional order. And uh, I'll try not to uh, get too political about it's it. Okay. But obviously, I teach, okay. I could get somewhat political. I'll just say that I teach U.S. con law. That's one of the areas I teach. And one of the amazing things about that since 2016 is I tell my students, whether in the United States or in Israel, listen, this is the law the way we studied it. This is the constitution that I was taught it and the way scholars write about it. But things are changing. And there's a lot of TBD to be determined. And one of the uh, um, you know, stunning uh, things to witness during the Trump administration is how many provocative constitutional uh, moves the Trump administration made. And they're really uh, sort of questions like, can he get away with that? Can the administration do that? Is that constitutional or not? Um, and one of the things you notice when it comes to constitutional law is there usually aren't black and white answers to these questions because it's sort of striking a balance of how to navigate these epic um, struggles between uh, different branches of government or individuals in government or values of justice and the realities of political needs. Um, so they're not going to be black and white uh, answers to those questions, and they're going to be a lot of unknowns. And to me, it's sort of heartening to see, well, this is a long struggle that people who cared about justice have thought about for centuries. And uh, I, I think, uh, you know, we can be hardened also by the fact that uh, there have been tendencies that seem to prevail over time. And that is that to try to think of ways to better safeguard uh, the autonomies of justice. One of the things I try to do in my book is move beyond that sort of principle to talk about certain ways of safeguarding the autonomies of justice, having more justices, who's, uh, who appoints the justices and onwards. I won't get into all the details here, but I'm saying the dilemmas are all, and also the need, uh, the urgency of finding good solutions that has been with us a long time, but we see that this struggle continues. That's in the US and of course in Israel, um, we know these same issues exist between the Netanyahu government and the attorney general uh, in Israel and uh, opposition um, and ministries of justice, ministers of justice and changing ideas about that. Um, so these challenges 
exist in the U.S., they exist in Israel, and we have to learn how to navigate them. Do you think that the current government in Israel, the way that the system is etched out, um, is reminiscent of the way that it was intended to be by the Jews in biblical times? Does it mirror what we have written about and read about in the Torah and other books that uh, Jews have carried with us throughout the centuries? When we think about Israel today as a Jewish and democratic state, often there's tension between what democracy um, demands and what Judaism demands. And sometimes I think uh, the dictates of Judaism are misrepresented, I would argue, um, by certain advocates that saying, well, Judaism insists on this, which is at odds with democratic ideas. That sometimes is true. I don't want to say that's never true. But I want to say in terms of these questions, actually Judaism, uh, I think way before um, most uh, democratic uh, systems got there, uh, Judaism did care about the sphere of justice and safeguarding it and protecting it and keeping it autonomous. So that is a deeply Jewish value. And that's an important uh, point to argue. Uh, so we shouldn't just try to have those values because of individual rights or civil liberties or the tyranny of government. Sometimes you hear that as sort of modern protesters at Robin Square being like there's an abuse of justice. But the people who should worry about justice shouldn't just be sort of uh, the, the modern proponents of uh, of civic rights, but should be also Jews who care about the traditions of justice and uh, the ideals of justice. So how, could think, somebody, how could somebody yeah. participate in that? Um, if they're I, not I going know. to be on strike, if they're not going to be protesting at Rubin Square, what would you say for, what, would, what could we take away that somebody might be able to do in, a, in an effort to exercise their civic duty and uh, to maintain integrity in the legal system? Yeah, that's a good question. I'm not, listen, I'm not, I, I, you know, when I, uh, based in Israel, I live near Robin Square and those protests uh, sometimes are great. They're, uh, you know, a voice of, uh, important voice of the people. Um, so I certainly in no way was, uh, you know, uh, questioning the value of that. I just don't think um, that portion of society should be the only group in society that cares about how um, the mechanism of justice are operating. So I think anybody who, um, you know, both committed citizens and uh, members of the legal profession um, and, uh, um, you know, academics also who are looking at what's going on um, in the political arena and the judicial arena should be concerned, should be involved, should care. And uh, if there's an encroachment, um, which I think there certainly has been some, um, you know, uh, flirtations with encroachments on the administration of justice by politically powerful um, oper operators. You know, that's something that should concern everybody. And uh, we need to figure out good ways to do this. You know, just again, in current events, let's say in the U.S., they're talking about, um, well, should we expand the size of the Supreme Court? That's one issue that's come up in the U.S. or in Israel, the question of can one, you know, in the U.S., can one impeach a president or under what conditions can one impeach a president if there's no crime? Or in Israel, uh, the question about uh, whether a, uh, a sitting prime minister can be indicted, can be convicted, et cetera, all these questions. These are uh, crucial and important questions, not just whether you're pro bb or anti bb pro-Trump or anti-Trump. It's about system of, uh, uh, of justice that, uh, have predated uh, these these uh, you know larger than life figures and will outdate will outdate them and all of us need to care about if we care about our institutions we need to care about um, you know how these issues play out and uh, be aware that this is not a simple thing um, this is something that the uh, civilizations have been struggling with for centuries and we have to try to find better ways of safeguarding systems of justice. Thank you so much. That was um, very insightful. Thank you for being on the show with us. It was a lot of fun. I look forward to listening to a lot of podcasts and maybe coming back at a, a point down the road to talk about these kinds of issues. And I hope we'll have some uh, improvements to share. Yeah, that would be great. A progress report uh, of, uh, of progress. That would be, that'd be something. We'll see. All right. Well, that was just very insightful and also really got me thinking about breaking the mold. These topics are so relevant today. Whether you look at the U.S. current state of affairs or Israeli government, 
Those who are interested in purchasing the book can get 30% off by using the promo code HOLIDAY20 to purchase the book on the Harvard University Press website. The book is about $40, but you can get 30% off if you go to the Harvard University Press website. All right, well, that's it for today's news. Today is Thursday, November 19th, 2020. Tel Aviv has a low of 17 degrees Celsius and a high of 24 degrees. That's 62 degrees Fahrenheit for the low, going up to 76 degrees for the high in that central city. Don't forget to subscribe to the Israel Daily News podcast on Spotify or Apple Podcasts or wherever you're hearing it from. I am everywhere. If you think that this show brings you value, if you think it makes you more educated at the dinner table, then send over a contribution. Today marks Today marks episode number 92, and we are getting close to 100 episodes. I would love to see financial support from my listeners by the time we make it to 100. There's a link in the show notes where you can send your support, and you can also find me on Patreon, where I will be updating content that is exclusive to Patreon users and content that you won't only hear on the podcast. Listeners to submit a donation of $5 per month for one year will receive a handwritten letter by me mailed to you with a special note from me. I'm going to include a special little po- I'm going to include a special little poem for you straight from the heart if you didn't know I love to write poems. Listeners who send over a $20 monthly donation will get access to a one-on-one Q&A with me via Zoom. I'm also working on getting merchandise. So you can be sure that you'll get some of that swag as well. And in these last 10 episodes, as we reach nearly 100, please share this show with everyone you know. I am trying to reach new audiences. I'll send you off today with a song called Liv Chor Nachon by Morty Weinstein, Nicole Raviv, and Idan Tomler. It is a fan favorite have a great and productive day and a Shabbat Shalom. Shalom. <laughs> Thank 
קוראים לזה לחיות. אתה אלמד לבחור נכון, להאמין, לראות שטוב, בלי להביט שוב לאחור. לבחור נכון